Okay, fine, we're live on Periscope. Right, well, good evening, everybody watching on Periscope, and thank you for joining us. Uh, here we are at the King's Fund on a sweltering evening. It's 40 degrees, isn't it? I'm, I'm, and I'm still wearing my vest. I may have to take my jacket off. Um, anyway, um, thank you all very much for coming. Uh, how many, who, who have you been, how many have been to a health chat before? Just put your hand up. Yeah. Oh, right, we've got, that's the alumni tonight. Okay, well, the evening, a very informal, our idea is just to sit and have a chat with the big names in, in healthcare and see uh, what they're up to and what their views are and, and how things are going. Um, most of these uh, conferences you go to these days, they say, will you please turn your mobile phones off? We want you to turn them on because we're big fans of social media, so... If you feel like tweeting, please do tweet. Terry, what's the, um, the handle? Hashtag is Lily Dylan Health Chat. Lily, H -C. you couldn't have had anything simpler, could you? <laughs> Lily Dylan H C. Ha Lily Dylan H C. There's a lot of L's in that, isn't there? <laughs> plenty, plenty of L's. Got an L and a handle. Um, so that, that's about it. Now we always have a welcome word for our sponsor, and tonight is no exception. <laughs> I want you to give it up. I can't believe he's here. We are blessed. He's amongst us, ladies and gentlemen. It's Michael Thin. Please. <laughs> well, as usual, even on a hot evening, you have to suffer ritual abuse from Roy, but <laughs> it is a great pleasure to welcome our guest. And when you think about it, um, every family who's had someone ill and who is wondering what treatment they're going to get can you imagine having the job of having to uh, look after the organisation that decides what treatments are available and what aren't? It must be um, immensely difficult. So um, I commend you to Andrew and thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much. Thank you. There was nothing like a good opening speech, and that was nothing like a good opening speech. <laughs> um, so we're very grateful to IMS Maxins, our sponsors, and of course uh, InterServe. Um, uh, who've uh, supported this for so long, and Salix, who run our front of house on evenings like this. So we're very grateful to them all because we couldn't do it without them. So thank you. So really, it's now my uh, great pleasure to uh, introduce uh, our guest for the evening. Um, he, he, the, <laughs> he was once described as a man who has less personality than a paperclip. Do you remember that? Ladies and gentlemen, Sir Andrew Dillon. <laughs> It was a very unkind quote, wasn't it? Did you know about that? Yeah, it was a, I don't know, was it, was it a Guardian profile? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, it, was, yeah. it was six or seven years ago now, uh, so obviously it left its scars. It, it's, it's uh, well, I just took a positive. That's a very useful thing. <laughs> Which of us in our lives has not at some point or other relied on a paper. It, exactly. Or cursed the fact that they couldn't find a paper. It, uh, yes, <laughs> or use them to break into a locker or... or, yeah. or, or Reboot your phone. Do you remember when you had to do that? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was it was only a paper clip. Actually, thinking about it, it's an extraordinary compliment. I know, <laughs> <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, it's the paper clip. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. So let's let's we we like to go right back to the beginning if we can. Uh, uh, you're Manchester, aren't you? You come from Manchester? Yeah. Well, right. Is it Sale you came from? I can't remember. I was born in uh, Sale Cottage Hospital. Yeah, technically yeah. in Cheshire, but brought up in Stratford in West Manchester. Yeah, and then. Uh, <coughs> you went actually. You went to uni later on. Did, did you have a break, or did you? How did you end up at uni? I did my A levels, uh, uh, and then so did you go straight to uni. Yeah, yeah. yeah oh, I thought yeah. there was a gap between. No, no, no. What did you do at uni? Uh, geography at Manchester. Really? Yeah. That's useful. It's very useful. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Helps you get around the trains, I suppose. Yeah, and myself other things. Yeah, and then you joined the um, the management trainee program. I did, although in those days, of course, it was the uh, National Administrative Training Scheme. We weren't managers, of course, we were just administrators. Yeah. In those days. yeah, so I did that. Some would say that, <laughs> that we could see the circle coming full right. time. Yeah, so, uh, uh, so where did you start? Um, I started, well, I stayed in Manchester, so uh, you can see a pattern developing. Yeah. And did the training scheme there and worked um, initially in Bolton, in West yeah. Manchester. Uh, Bolton Royal Infirmary. Still there? Uh, no, that's closed. Yeah. Um, oh, no, Anchor, no, no, Anchorage Hospital in central Manchester, yeah. which I left and which closed. And then I went to Bolton Royal Infirmary for a few years and then left and that closed. <laughs> and then I went to Queen Elizabeth Hospital for Children in Hackney and left and that closed. Um, and then I went to the Royal London 
uh, in Whitechapel, but I failed to play. <laughs> <laughs> I think mean, it's making it a good job of it. <laughs> so we were there just recently, and we took the Academy on the road. I had a look at the helicopter on the roof. Yeah. Very yeah. exciting. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And then, so you, and your first big break was St George's, really, I suppose, was it? Um, well, I guess we were initially going to work for Ron Kerr at, um, in, at the Royal London, or London as it was then. Yes. Uh, Ron was the, was the hospital secretary, and when he left, uh, it was just as general management was being introduced, <coughs> and I was an acting hospital secretary, so I was the last hospital secretary um, of the Royal London. Really? How awesome. interesting. Yeah. Where all those titles disappeared and the kind of um, general management stuff came in. So I guess it was that, and that's, that was a, I mean, a fantastic experience. Roy's a great guy to work for. <coughs> Lots of stuff uh, going on in a huge institution. Um, and just paved the way for me then to go to the Royal Free, uh, where I was the um, general manager of the acute units, and then on to St. George's. Yeah. So you were around when the Griffiths report? Yeah, that was, that was the opportunity to move from Queen Elizabeth's, uh, just before it closed, to uh, the Royal London. Yeah, <coughs> I, I remember when that came out, there was that wonderful quote in it, wasn't it, that if, if Florence Nightingale was alive today, she'd wander around with a lamp saying, who's running this hospital? Indeed. And that, to a large extent, was true, because I mean, before Griffiths, these were simply little admin units um, of district health authorities, which were themselves admin units of area health authorities, and then there was a regional health authority on top. And what had happened was that all that decision-making responsibility had been sucked up to you know whatever the most senior level was prepared to take responsibility for. Yeah. So if you were responsible day to day for organising services, for solving problems, for critically for actually managing the budget, you had relatively little authority. So the huge benefit it seemed to me to be a, a Griffiths was the repatriation of that decision-making responsibility. Yeah. You are right, because at that time I was the chairman of a district health authority. I've been the vice chairman, became the chairman, and had special responsibility for Frimley Park Hospital, funny enough, um, because it was in my ward, because I was a councillor as well. So they said, oh, well, you can go and run Frimley Park Hospital. Uh, and we had a perfectly capable administrator there, but uh, you are absolutely right, because everybody passes decisions up. Yeah. No one, so yeah, yeah. No one would make decisions. Yeah. And yeah. so that was how I got first involved in Friendly Park, which was, absolutely, you're absolutely right. And I mean, what, w w describe for me then, at that time, the relationships between management and administrators and the medical staff, the, the, the doctors and the consultants and all the rest of it. I mean, my recollection is they just ruled the roost, really. I, I think a lot depended on the leadership, the clinical leadership. Uh, in the institution, as well as obviously the, the management leadership. Um, those personal relations were critical. Um, the ability, um, I think, of the chief executive or the equivalent of unit general manager, whatever the title was at the time, to articulate the nature of the challenge and how clinicians could contribute to resolving it in ways that didn't completely compromise their ability to do the things that they enjoyed doing and liked doing, if that were important. And where you got that right, you had a half decent chance of um, getting a dialogue going, which led to a good atmosphere. And my recollection, particularly in very big institutions like the Royal London or the Royal Free or St George's where I worked was, was that they were so big that you had the full range of relationships from the catastrophic and bad to the really buzzy. Yeah. Um, and it's just all about those personalities. Yeah. Just, just, just uh, I, I want to talk about Manchester a minute, bit, but going to St George's. I mean, at that, at the time when you went there, it was that self-contained teaching hospital, lots of doctors on rotation, um, and it was for us in even out in Surrey, it was like the centre of everything. Everything was run by St George's. Really, the junior doctors' rotation. You then upset the uh, the dean and, and all that. It was a, a fiefdom. Well, St George's in South West London has always had important relationships with um, institutions uh, down in Surrey and in Sussex. Um, and when I was there, of course, there, there was this notion of a uh, rather patronisingly, I thought, even at the time, of a hub and spoke. You know, the hub yeah. was the teaching hospital. That's where all the really important stuff took place. The serious cases, the difficult things, and naturally the money. Uh, and everything out there was just somewhere on at the end of a spoke, and its, and its function was to feed the central institution. 
Um, and that's changed, obviously, completely now. It, but it you has. still need that relationship where you've got a concentration of specialist services, which you just simply can't distribute, um, and um, a constructive peer relationship with institutions in other parts of the country. But the nature of cha training changed, didn't it, with junior doctors? I mean, there was a time when the junior doctors would come, they'd be with you for a lot longer, they'd be part of a firm. Um, as it is now, the rotations can be as quick as three months. Yeah, um, no, the whole nature of training has changed completely. Yeah. That's at the heart of the junior, junior doctors. doctors. Yeah, exactly. I think that's the heart of the junior doctors. Dispute. I mean, uh, we, we spent a lot of time on the picket line filming and doing stuff. Uh, and it was pretty clear that the, the junior doctors didn't really have a relationship with the, with the hospitals they were in. They would just kind of pass through, didn't connect with the hospital. It's very difficult for managers to connect because you know, they were passing through all kinds of rotor and scheduling problems. And the new contract is a minefield of that. And it is, um, it is a shame that we've lost that sort of connection to the firm. Mm, but I think the junior doctor's dispute is more complex than a concern about the mechanics oh, of the rotor. And the yeah. mechanics of the rotor is very important, particularly where so much of your life is consumed by the job, um, as it is for junior doctors with all of the evening, nighttime, and weekend work. So you need to get that right. But there's, there's something else there, a kind of um, underlying concern and dissatisfaction somehow. Partly, I think, with the nature of the NHS, which is just a function of the pressure that the system's under. There's something a bit political in there as well in relation to the government. Um, there's something about, I think, about the, perhaps a concern about the way the, um, the profession itself is being challenged. Uh, and I think that works both ways, because I think the junior doctors need to uh, both aspire to the, obviously aspire to the professional standards uh, that their career is going to demand and that their predecessors have had, but also recognise that they are part of a workforce which needs to change and develop. They need to be part of a team. They have to work in that way. Yeah. You, you, there's no question about it. You're right. They, they are the lightning rod for a lot of other dissatisfaction there is. And of course it's not over yet. And now we've got the consultants now agreeing to go back, they've agreed today to reopen discussions about the contract. <coughs> Excuse me. I think that it's not over yet. And just, just to go back to Manchester, um, what do you make of Devo? You see today now that the CCG is now saying it's going to join forces with the council. Not quite sure how and where the governance will lie or how the law will fit, but that's what they've announced today. Well, I think it's really exciting. Do you? I think, yeah, I think it's a fantastic opportunity to experiment with all sorts of different things, different ways in pooling and managing money, um, different ways to manage the responsibility for our health and care across that traditionally very difficult health and social care divide. Um, it's an opportunity, as we're starting to see, of institutions inside the NHS in the Manchester area rethinking their relationships. You know, we were talking a moment ago about the, what well, I think were the benefits of the Griffiths Review and the introduction of general management, that repatriation of uh, management responsibility. But the downside of that is that it increases the granularity in the system, which is good in the sense that you've got people working locally, feeling responsible, um, creating a dialogue, taking responsibility. Um, <coughs> But on the other hand, it, it means that, that um, they don't see themselves as that's their identity. And there are lots and lots of these institutions with that identity. And unless they can work constructively together, there's a risk that although they're managing you know, their own affairs very effectively, that they're not stopping and looking up and seeing the bigger picture and how uh, they need to work together in order to make more than just the sum of the parts to help resolve the problems that they're all facing. Um, so devolution in Manchester, I think, is rather neatly recognise the, the benefits of the strong leadership that exists in, the many, in many institutions in Manchester. That's created a forum in which they can come together clear, very enthusiastically from my observation yeah. to... Bernstein is very powerful. Yeah, well, to uh, another sort of activist catalyst, catalyst yeah. but to come together to create relationships which they know they need to do in order to resolve the particular funding challenge, but also the other uh, issues that they're facing. Yeah. It'll be interesting to see how it works out. I mean, a lot of people are saying it's, it's Devo, it's just dumping debt, really. I mean, I mean, you can only spend a pound once, as we know. True, but um, 
you're, to the extent you're dumping anything, you're dumping it into a very different context mm. uh, from the one that exists. Yeah. So you've got now, I think, a genuine desire to work effectively across the local government uh, NHS divide. Um, yeah, so there are some, really yeah, there are some changes, aren't there, that do somehow or other universally enthuse the, the uh, I mean, if you look at the, the Lansley reforms, which just seem to be collectively pissing everybody off because nobody thought it was a good idea. We go back to the Thatcher reforms. Uh, I remember that w w was an enthusiastic, that was received fairly enthusiastically. I mean, it wasn't without, you know, some trade union problems and I had my car damaged <laughs> during the course of taking over a trust. But the, <coughs> the, the there was an enthusiasm about that, wasn't there, that, pe that people would sort of kind of get the weight of the bureaucracy off their shoulders. I mean, we never knew how it would turn out to be, but it was a good time, wasn't it? I thought Thatcher reforms were, were a good time. Um, what well, one has to be careful what one says, depending on which aspect of well, which of Thatcher's you reforms. Probably, you've you've know, got your bloody nighter. Well, I won't take it away. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, I'm hurt. <laughs> it's only on loan. <laughs> but I think the, yeah, but nevertheless, the accumulation of reforms that have, um, uh, liberated the creative thinking that actually we're beginning to see now as um, the, the latest initiative to get area-wide NHS local government planning together these sustainability and transformation footprints mm -hmm. um, which from my personal observation of the proposals that have been put forward and my contact with the groups that are leading those uh, changes I think again is a weird it's really interesting to see when you give people the freedom to think through solutions outside of formally prescribed processes. And I was as concerned as anybody, I think, with Lansley's reforms that kind of ripped out the management backbone of the system and sort of allowed it to flop down and see what happened, how did it struggle to create something. Um, and I'm not, I don't think that, that, that it's ne we've necessarily got to this place through the right route, but the fact that we've got to this point where there is a real enthusiasm, I think, locally to collectively challenge to collectively solve local problems, whether it's in the context of a devolution arrangement like Manchester or simply just through the STP process. Yeah. So it's quite encouraging. The, the pressures though are, are colossal now, aren't they? I was in I was at Fremley Park on um, on Sunday and um, I walked through A and E at Fremley Park. Now Fremley is probably the best hospital in the country <clears throat> according to the uh, comedians at the CQC. And, and it is, I mean, Andrew Morris, fantastic guy, uh, appointed 30 years ago by a very far-sighted young chairman of a <laughs> district health authority. And he's still there. Modesty prevents me from I'm telling you it was, but uh, he's been there and he's done a great job, joking aside. But there I was on Sunday, walking through A&E, which is, 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 it hasn't been open long. I mean, it's just, it looks like an airline lounge, you know great sweeping sofas and low leather benches and yes, you know, much too good for them really, but I mean, just a stunning place. But it was packed. It was absolutely rammed with people, standing room only. It was like EasyJet, you know, waiting to take off. It was just horrendous. Average age, I would think, between late teens and 55. Um, packed to the gunnels. <coughs> And it was three o'clock in the afternoon on Sunday. What the hell are they all doing there? Where have they come from? I know that um, the British Airways <coughs> checking system was down. It was a key. Anywhere that looks like it. <laughs> Where's all the demand coming? Have you done any work at NICE on this on demand? Not really, no, it's not in the sense that it's not in that kind of Do you of think somebody should? Formal analysis. Um, well, not at NICE. Um, I'm, I'm conscious that um, NHS England have demand models which are being used by this by these STPs um, as part of their planning. Well, they've only just arrived. Right. STPs are strategic health authorities coming back, I suppose. But I mean, the, 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 we are missing a strategic hand, I think that's true. But I'm just, it just wonders where the demand is coming from. You know, we're supposed to, we're all led to believe it's all little old ladies coming in under a blue light. And actually, no. I mean, there's probably a lot of little old ladies that come in under a blue light, and I'm not sure really whether there's any more little old ladies than there ever was. But to, to walk through A&E at three o'clock on a Sunday afternoon and see it rammed with people that, 
you know, you, you would think that the last people would be in A&E. You know, what's going on? And I can't, I don't know anybody who's done any real demand management issues or, you know. I don't, it's, I don't know, specifically in that case, it may just be, as you can agree, there are always spikes of activity um, in uh, A&E departments, um, whether it's a functioning, particularly if something that's going on in primary care services locally. Um, well, they're all having a barbecue. <coughs> yeah, well, sunny, sunny, tricky sunny, old day, sunny, sunny summer days. <laughs> anyway, so you you, uh, you had a good time at uh, St George's, I think, didn't you? Really? Yeah, I was there for nine years. Yeah, you had a bit so of a row with the CQC at one stage, didn't you? I don't think they existed when uh, Nice when oh, I was. That was so. somebody after you. Okay, and then you ended up at Nice. Yeah. And that's really where it all got very interesting, didn't it? Yeah. I, I, and one of your consultants, when you left, he told he said that uh, he gave you a hug and a bunch of flowers. Did he? Yeah. <laughs> I have no recollection of that, but I'm very grateful to him. <laughs> <laughs> well, 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 yeah. <laughs> and, and of course, the, the, you had a baptism of fire there, really, didn't you? I mean, you, in fact, I, I, you were just telling me, you reminded me earlier, I chaired one of the first ever meetings of you in public. You, you did, yes. I, I can't remember whether I actually started work, but you chaired a meeting at Kingston Hospital. Yeah. Um, John Langer, Kingston Univ th no, 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 Kingston University. Yeah, yeah. that's so, right. Yeah. Was, I don't know who was there. It was an audience. Yeah. Um, and you were as rude about nice then as you have ever been. <laughs> <laughs> 17 years since. Yeah, I just felt it was a bit of a target. And it's nice and nasty, isn't it? Not, yeah. avail not available, so treat yourself. Yeah, that was exactly the acronym that you joined. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I'm still using it 17 yeah. years later. I usually get some laugh, but not with this dozy lot. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, so tell us about the early days of NICE, because it was very political, wasn't it, you, when you started off? Yeah, I mean, it was uh, extraordinary. I mean, to go from uh, running St George's with, you know, four and a half thousand people and whatever, 250 million pounds, 300 million pound budget, to nice with um, no one at all uh, because it was a completely new institution. <laughs> I, was, I was the only, the only employee um, yeah. in some rented offices in Covent Garden and that was the other extraordinary thing going from uh, two scenes. St George's Hospital site is very nice for those of you who know it's a, it's a place to work but going from um, two scene to Covent Garden to these rented offices and, and I can remember going in on the first day before my rulings came in there was just it was just Nobody, me and a, a laptop beside borrowed from St George's, um, opening the post. Um, and it was amazing, really. And I felt then it was an extraordinary privilege to be able to set up an organisation from scratch. And yeah. I still feel the same now. It's, um, it has been, it's been great. It's been a yeah. real breeze. And you'd hardly got your feet under the, I should say, my ex wife used to work for you, Antonia she Rogers. She was yeah. the director of communications. And very good she was, too. She was. Um, just in case she's watching, uh, but I'm not upset. Um, <laughs> she wants to stop the camera. No. <laughs> so then, uh, I, the, what, the story I want to get to, the, the thing I did, we, we, which we got to talk about, was was um, what's his name from Glaxo? What was his name? Um, Sykes. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Richard Sykes. And, and, uh, now that was all about something called Relenza, wasn't it? Yeah, this is a drug that Black Sabbath welcome. Was, was, was this the first drug you you you, yeah. you you it was the first drug that they ever looked at, yeah. and it was the and the you had know, Downing Street crawling all over you to get some kind of assessment. Well, we thought it would be it was a drug for treating flu. Yeah. Um, so it was thought to be a relatively easy thing to analyze a few studies. Um, it was you know there and available. Um, Quite a big issue in primary care, of course, because if you have a really bad winter, people are piling in, and everybody knows that there's some new drug for treating flu. Everyone will want it. So, um, getting some advice out before the winter, and this would have been we nice started in the April, uh, was thought to be quite important and a good thing for nice, you know, get ourselves known. So, we did a rapid appraisal um, and um, published negative guidance, so recommending against. That was the first time you'd done a rapid anything at all. But, but <laughs> were you, we, so not only the first appraisal did, it was the first fast track. Were, were, you, you were under some pressure from the politicians, weren't you, to get the appraisal out? Well, we were put, um, kind of, well, yes, but then, but we, had, we were putting ourselves under pressure because we wanted to do it. We wanted yeah. to get something published because the risk was you, you get set up as an organisation like NICE and because the lead times 
when you're careful with the evidence and when you're consultative and all that kind of stuff, can stretch out for some time. So we certainly didn't want to wait until 2000, I mean, they established in April 1999, yeah. to publish something. So we put ourselves under the pressure. We wanted to do it. Yeah, and, and it was a re really a baptism of pharmacy because, it, as I remember it, the drug, um, it hadn't been developed by Glaxo, had it? They bought it in from some Australian uh, pharmaceutical company, bought it. it, was, it, it the thing about the drug, it was a nasal thing. They squirted up your nose or something. Yes. Yeah, yeah, you squirted this stuff up your nose and you didn't get the <laughs> feel good. Yeah. But you had to squirt it up within 48 hours of having the symptoms or something. Yeah. Kill it. I mean, it was just, yeah, was. it was bizarre. It was about as useless as it could possibly be. But they bought... But we, we did subsequently recommend it. So you <laughs> well, you, yeah, well, you recommend a lot of stuff. We'll get on to that. Um, but you recommended, you did recommend. But they, you, so you, within 48 hours of thinking you might get the flu, you just have to get this stuff and squirt it up your roots and then it would stop again. But it's just ridiculous. Anyway, so... Um, but wasn't it? I read. I think I read it myself that the Australian trials um, mm. apparently had been on two people or something that had got the flu. Yeah. I mean, they were useless trials. Right? No, 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 no. There was a reasonable evidence base to, yeah. uh, to make a decision. Right? Yeah. Um, uh, Glaxo, welcome. I think at the time, this is a long time ago now. I think we're also conducting trials on the use of the drug in the elderly and people who are immunocompromised. And um, subsequently, when we reviewed it a year or so later, it was for those groups that we thought there was an argument for yeah. using it. But uh, once, when we published it, of course, it published the negative guidance, it created an absolute storm. Richard Sykes was furious, allegedly. Yeah. Richard Sykes was the chairman of Glaxo. Yeah, yeah and uh, allegedly saying he was going to pull investment and people out of the UK. Yeah. Uh, well, 1,800 people lost their jobs, didn't they? I don't know. Well, there were 1,800 job losses, but I mean, I, it, 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 that he attributed wow. to the decision whether or not, whether or not they, it was actually attributed yeah. to Relenza, which was yeah. the name of the drug, or not. Well, I, I guess yeah. you can argue about it. But he he then said, I was going. He, he demanded to see the prime minister, Tony Blair. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Tony Blair. Said, what did Tony Blair say to you? Um, he didn't. Uh, I don't recall Tony Blair saying anything to us. Um, I can remember, I can vaguely remember a conversation with Simon Stevens, who was then, um, I think, still then Frank Dobson's uh, special advisor. Simon was very much involved in the creation, the birth of Nice yes. at the time, um, which I think is rather handy now. But I don't think we talked to Tony Blair. I do remember a conversation with Tony Blair. Mike Rollins and I were invited in to speak to him. He was there with um, whoever at that stage was his special advisor. Uh, an extraordinary conversation. We sat down on some sofas and just talked. He was very knowledgeable about NICE. He seemed very proud of creating NICE and just sat there and said, you've got what you want. And that, I think that's the only time in my entire career in the NHS where someone has said, have you got what you want? As opposed to, this is what you've got, so now tell me what you can do with it. Yeah. Or we're going to take this away. Yeah. And the other thing about, which is quite important for, for NICE and has remained very important, was that we realised when we'd finished the guidance and we wrote to publish it that we didn't know whether or not we should publish it or whether we should send it to Frank Dobson so he could issue it to the NHS. I'm not quite sure that we worked that out. So I, um, I left a message with uh, Frank Dobson's office to say, you know, we're ready to go, do you want this thing? Um, and I got a phone call about 11 o'clock at night while I was in bed from Frank saying, it's your guidance, so you publish it, you take responsibility for it. Yeah. And that's really important because that was, that was massively important for our credibility and our independence. It meant that we weren't supplying stuff to the Century State who then made a decision about whether or not we should publish it. This was going to be our responsibility. We had to do it and stand by it, explain it and defend it. Um, and that's been very important for us. Yeah, and Mike Rawlings was a good guy, wasn't he, Sir, Sir Mike, as he became? He was fantastic, uh, yeah. chairman. Yeah, he was absolutely the right person for the job at the time that Nice was established. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, I, I think he guided you through some pretty tricky times as well. Yeah. Uh, and, a, and a very nice man, had a yeah. great way with it. Yeah, and, yeah. and I think, uh, it, uh, I think it's a loss that, that he's, he's gone. Well, then, of course, I, say, I mean, he was he was there for thirteen years. Yeah. So he'd done way past his standards then, and he's been replaced. He's been replaced by somebody who actually is precisely the right person for Nice now. Um, I mean, you know, if Mike had stayed for another five years, everyone would have been happy about it. But yeah. I think he might would agree that, given the nature and the range of responsibilities that Nice has. 
got and the organisation has grown into. Somebody with David Haslam's background as a general practitioner, with that ability to look right across the system and into social care, with the sort of experiences that might never have as a clinical pharmacologist, uh, are serving us really well now. Yeah. And then you developed the quality. Well, we didn't. That was done by health well, economists. You adopted it. <laughs> it was York, wasn't it? Yeah. 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 Tell us about the quality. Well, the quality. Because that was the start of all your problems, I think. Yeah. Uh, well, it's a, it's, a, it's a means of explaining our way out of some of our problems, I think. Yeah. It's, a, it's a way of expressing value for money and health. It allows us to uh, convey um, the nature of uh, what's being gained and what's being lost in terms of health care as a result of decisions we take either to recommend or not recommend new treatments and services for the NHS. And it's really 30 grand, is it? Well, um, yes, if you use an incremental cost effectiveness ratio, so pounds per quality, uh, uh, incremental because it's on top of what it is uh, that we're spending at the moment with whatever current standard of care is, you need to um, take a view about how many pounds per quality you're prepared to accept before you believe that you're displacing more health than uh, you're bringing in with a new intervention. And um, until very recently, uh, there was no empirical work done on what the threshold should be. And when NICE was established, we had all sorts of discussions with health economists, with clinicians who used um, economic evaluation to inform decision making. Uh, we talked to people inside the Department of Health um, who had responsibility for uh, resource management um, <coughs> and came to the view that at about £20,000, subsequently modified to between twenty and £30,000 per quality, um, we felt confident that we could recommend up to that point and not displace more health than we were bringing in at the time. The most recent piece of work by Carl Paxton uh, at York University suggested that in fact the threshold should be much lower than that. Uh, lower? Uh, much lower than that. Because my next question was, was going to be, is there, a re is there an argument to raise it? Well, he's put forward um, a well-argued um, case for reducing it to somewhere between, um, I think it's about £13,000 per quality. That's halving. That's right. That yeah. would give you so much grief, wouldn't it? Because they're going to say you're under financial, well, the NHS is under financial pressure. If you suddenly introduce this, um, then unless, unless there there is a fundamental shift in pricing policy for new life sciences products, drugs and other things, um, very little would be recommended by NICE. So you have to decide uh, whether or not you think that's likely, um, or if not, whether you think the NHS will ultimately be better off um, spending its money on the stuff that we do that we know is cost effective, so just doing more of that, um, and not the new stuff well, I mean that. Yes, I mean that's a really interesting point. It? And it was something I was going to, you know, let's talk about that now because, given the the financial pressures the NHS finds itself in, which are not going to be resolved any time soon. I mean, I, my guess is that Philip Hammond will probably lob the NHS a bit of a bung um, to sort of make everybody feel a bit better over Brexit and uh, he's, and Osborne of yeah. course dumped his austerity policy and was probably going to give the NHS a bung. So I think a bung is in the offing of some sort, but that I guess will just disappear in the operations in some way or other. Um, the, all the rumours are around um, uh, this reset letter that it's going to make strong men weep and um, jump off the top of tall buildings but we might I, I mean what, what made me think about this was, was that um, Jim Mackey we call him the Jim Reaper the, the Jim Reaper um, has said pretty much to the CQC you can forget all your palaver about now what we've got is what we've got thanks very much that's enough and, uh, and a good thing too there maybe there is a, an argument given the pressures now is just to pause everything and say look we've got what we've got we're going to make it run as well as we can make it run 
do the best we can with what we got and say to NICE, listen, thanks for all your wonderful advice and all these new drugs, but we're going to struggle by with the medicine cabinet we've got. Cheerio. Well, um, a number of things. One is it's simply not realistic to press the pause button. Patients won't accept that. The tens of thousands of um, professionals working in the NHS and people who support them um, simply won't accept that. Uh, the momentum of their professional curiosity, their desire to get good outcomes, will simply overwhelm any attempt to simply just stop and say we're not doing anything new at all. Um, so I don't think that's realistic. And actually, again, I'm just thinking, just referring back to the, the recent experience that I've had listening to the plans and proposals being put forward by the STPs, um, suggests that that's not what they're doing, notwithstanding the sometimes very significant um, gaps that exist in the funding that they're getting now, the funding they're going to get in 2020, and the things and the expenditure plans that uh, uh, they've got in place. Um, Pressing the pause button has not been part of any of those plans. No, no, quite the opposite. It's, well, it, much yeah. more, it's, it's much more intelligent and creative approach. And as for not needing that, nice. Listen, if you've got relatively little money, you need nice even more because you've got to be absolutely confident that the money that you're spending on the thing that you're spending it on, you're maximizing outcomes for patients. How much have you disinvested in? Um, if you go onto the NICE website, um, uh, the savings and productivity section of the supremely easy to navigate NICE yeah. website, uh, you'll find over a thousand um, recommendations pulled from our guidance, running into, he safely says, hundreds of millions of pounds. So you don't know. Well, you used to publish an annual thing, didn't you, about how much NICE has saved. Do you not do that anymore? I don't think we ever. Yeah, you did. You published a, you used to publish a, an, an analysis of nice savings. I thought, I'm sure you have. I've, I've linked to it. It's much more useful, though, uh, to have very specific examples which are worked through and which can be taken and applied locally uh, by, end of, by local services than to publish a, a number that doesn't mean anything. Because well, the number that matters is what you can generate by putting in place the recommendations that we've made, uh, where we're saying either stop doing this altogether, or alternatively, take a look at the way you're using this intervention and make sure you're using it in these circumstances and not in those circumstances. I mean, so, certainly the whole attitude to NICE has changed, isn't it? In the early days, we had clinicians saying NICE would kill people because they were making decisions for them, and the pharmaceutical industry was saying, you're going to kill people, we're going to move out of the country because no one's going to buy our product. Now, the pharmaceutical industry falls over itself to get a tick in the nice box and and clinicians won't do anything unless it's got nice approval well um i mean uh, you exaggerate to make a point i know i mean no. there's a range of there's always there always has been and there still is a range of views amongst uh people working in the nhs about nice you must be pleased with the way the attitudes have changed yeah, i am i mean i think it's I a think, lot easier now than i think works. we're broadly accepted yeah, um, and a useful part of the system. And, and indeed, you are overseas as well. I want to come on to that, but let's just come, let's come back to this whole thing about you know the the purpose of nice. Um, we we we. I, I, you see, I don't I don't think that that it's so, as as naive as you put it to say let's press the pause button. I actually think it's a very sensible thing to do uh, because, but listen, let's face it, we we don't have a, such a bad health system now. Um, there aren't that many areas of medicine, I don't think, where we are desperately in need of, of soon some new wonder drug. I mean, we've got plenty of wonder drugs, thanks very much. And I mean, I know, you know cancer is, 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 remains an issue, but, uh, but most of the new cancer drugs that are coming are costing us a fortune. So, and if we did press the pause button, well, what would be the consequence of that? Uh, I don't think, uh, I think a lot of clinicians would kind of get it. I guess it depends a bit on what you mean by pressing the pause button. Um, we know that there's a lot of variation in the delivery of um, services using interventions which we're confident represent good value for them. And that's what Patrick Carter, who sat in that seat a couple of weeks ago, has said exactly yeah. the same thing. So, you know, variation, okay, variation is the enemy of quality, <coughs> we get that. Um, but we've got your guidance, thanks very much. We've just got to make people follow it now. Yeah, so if the pause button is, um, let's not do anything new at all, 
uh, let's just concentrate on making sure everybody is doing all the things that are already recommended to be um, useful. If we just did, um, if, we actually, if, all, if all we did was just put the guidance that NICE put into place in practice, we'd have a really good healthcare system with very good outcomes. Mm. But there is variation. Well, if everybody bought bog rolls at the right price, we'd save a lot of money. I don't, we get a, we yeah. don't have that, do we? But obviously, in fact, I would love the NHS to do nothing but uh, examine what it's doing and make sure it's um, performing against NICE guidance. The, it's just not realistic to say we're just going to stop and not take new stuff coming in. Because apart from anything else, some of that new stuff will be just really very good. Um, I mean, the hepatitis C treatments, which are causing um, some interesting controversies around the system, are things that we simply just could not say, we're not going to do this. This is something which uh, will, has, will revolutionize the experience of the disease, and ultimately over time, hopefully, have a very significant impact on what the management of that disease has been costing in the past. So we have to do that. But the answer is, of course, we've got to be selective about it. We've got to be very careful about what we adopt. We have to avoid just being dazzled by the glittery new stuff that's there, glittering simply because it's new. However forceful and compelling the arguments about taking it up might be, if it can't demonstrate uh, real significant um, incremental therapeutic benefit and value for money over a reasonably short period of time, that's what's very important. We have to take a balanced view about the new stuff that's coming in. Um, take the best of it, make the resources available, and concentrate on leveling the system up to do the stuff that we already know. A, b a bigger sure. bite around uh, complying with your guidance. I mean, let, let's think about the pharmaceutical industry for a moment, which, you know, the essential ingredient, the, the, the other bit of the triangle, I suppose, is you, the service and the pharmaceutical industry. If you think about them, I mean, on the one hand, you could say, look, these are stunningly clever uh, industries employing some very bright people and a lot of other a lot, employing a lot of people generally in the economy they're important in the economy they're important in the markets uh, it is not easy to find a molecule that you can turn into a, a, a drug these days because you know quite a lot of the the, the bats of the places are covered um, all they can do really is bring us uh, expensive drugs you wrote a, an interesting piece I was reading the other day saying if it costs 1.2 billion to introduce a, a drug, why does it cost that much? Prove it. And I'm not sure if you ever got an answer, but let's take it for granted that it, just for a moment, that it does cost that kind of money to introduce <laughs> a new drug. Although I, I am skeptical like you are. They have somehow or other got to amortise that investment because they have shareholders to think about and we've all got pension funds and we've all got a big slice of interest in pharmaceutical companies. Now you've done some interesting deals haven't you on some of the very high price drugs. Tell us a little bit about the thinking behind that and you know how you see the future of some of these. It's a very interesting topic isn't it? Yeah it, it, it is. Free. It's, a, it's, a very, it's, it's a really important area. For some time in this country drug companies, other life sciences companies, when they're going through NICE's technology appraisal program, got the ability to um, offer, in effect, offer a discount on the cost to the NHS of acquiring the product. Okay, can I just ask you there, yeah. uh, what would make them do that? Is it, is it because it's a very narrow group cohort of patients, or do they know it's like whackingly expensive and they're never going to get anywhere with it? Or? Well, the latter, uh, really? because they know otherwise they're not going to be able to sell the product, and, and particularly they're not going to get um, positive recommendation from NICE. And one of the benefits of... Can, again, again, can I just talk, because yeah. I, I, can I like to kind of tease out the elements of this. Um, I used to write a, a monthly column in pharmaceutical marketing, and yeah. you probably know, so I've written about the pharmaceutical industry for I don't know, 20 years, I don't do it now, but uh, I got to know them quite well, really, and, and, and the development costs of um, introducing new drugs. And it was, I just stopped writing at the point when they just started going overseas to do clinical trials, because they used to do a lot of them here. They've moved a lot to China now. I think uh, AstraZeneca have moved to China. A lot's done in India to try and make the, the cost of the trials cheaper. Um, they have, I, I think, they have 
got the message that the trials have got to be cheaper, but they just have to be safe as well. Well, they do, and I'm not really in a position to comment on whether or not trials conducted outside the UK are safe or not, and that's not of your No, no, no I'm not saying they're not. No, I'm not saying they're not. I'm saying they're cheaper yeah. outside the UK. Yeah, I think that's right. The UK, mm -hmm. um, the, the, the UK needs to be a competitive place to conduct cl clinical trials, but the actual cost of doing the trial really is only part of that. It's also about the quality um, of the research that's undertaken. Um, um, and it's about the infrastructure, um, about the nature of the health system in which the study is being done. So there's a, there's a whole package that companies take into account. But it's true that they, companies can do clinical trials cheaper mm. elsewhere. And sorry, to, so to bring you back at the point where they do a deal, who, who, who triggers that conversation? Uh, the companies. Um, we can't say to a company, look, if you just notch it down by 10%, you'll be okay. Uh, we have to take the offer from the company. But the benefit of the patient access schemes, as they're called, these discounts have that generic title. A patient access scheme can be anything from a simple discount through to uh, a complex responder scheme where um, the, ultimately what the NHS pays is a function of how well the drugs worked uh, in the patients that have used it. But the raw rest into that, the benefit to the company is it's confidential. So uh, they don't need to they can have a declared list price for the UK, uh, but actually the UK pays something less than that. But for the international market, um, and a big chunk of the world uses the UK as a reference market in their negotiations with companies for the same products elsewhere in the world, uh, they're looking at the list price. So that co the confidentiality of the patient access is an important aspect of this. That's really interesting. I never knew that that was I thought they were all declared because some of them do declare them, don't they? I suppose they feel there's a philanthropic advantage to say they're discounted. Well, they so there are more discounts going on that we know than we know about. Well, there's all you always know about the discount, um, but the discount, but you don't know what the amount of the discount is. I see. In fact, the right. system. And is that becoming more frequent? Um, it's it's. Depends on the nature of this. For cancer treatments, it's typical for there to be a patient. Yeah, there's just, a, I mean, cancer's interesting because you remember the Herceptin row? Yeah. When, uh, what was her name? Uh, Patty Hewitt, wasn't it? When she was a Secretary of State, uh, she got uh, <laughs> mugged <laughs> at a conference and ended up agreeing that everyone could have Herceptin on Tuesday. Um, Herceptin was an interesting drug, wasn't it? Because it was a different delivery mechanism. Well, it was it was it targeted a particular subset yes. um, of people with breast cancer. Yeah, and it kind of opened the door to to subsequent drugs have been have become yes. more sophisticated. So it's almost yeah, yeah, yeah. really yeah. it was almost in inverted commas experimental, and one wonders how many more of those really high priced, early developed drugs are in the same context and. And do you think we can expect more from the cancer yeah. drugs as they develop over time? More and more, the drugs will be targeted at um, particular groups of patients with particular characteristics, which can be identified uh, in advance. Yeah. So going back to your point about, well, if it does cost £1.2 billion pounds to develop a new drug, um, if you can recover that cost over um, 100,000 people, that's one thing. If in fact you're recovering that cost over 10,000 people, yeah. um, then how much will you need to charge per patient in those circumstances? Well, that's, that's and will health point. systems, be, even the really wealthy health systems, be able to afford it? Well, that's the point, is it? Because poor people have <coughs> complicated cancers as well as rich people. And where you might be able to cover the whole cost globally or make it cheaper, mm -hmm. If the, only the rich countries can amortise the cost or, or subsume the cost in their budgets, it, it will drive the costs up. Uh, companies do recognise this, and there's much talk in the industry about um, the fact that the model for developing and pricing drugs is broken and they need to do something different and change it. But I guess like any industry, they respond to their markets, and if the market will pay, if it'll bear the cost, then there's relatively little incentive particularly when, of course, for uh, a first-in-class drug, there's no competition. Um, for, for
for the industry to change in the way that competition in other industries has forced uh, some very significant changes um, in pricing. If you look at, there's no comparison between the treatment of the cancer and the television. But if you think about what you would have paid five years ago for you know, a big screen TV, um, thousands of pounds, and now you can go into Tesco and pick a very good quality big screen TV up for 150 quid. So uh, they're, they're very different products, they're very different markets, but I think it's a real challenge for the industry to engage with itself to make those changes, but it does need to do it. Well, it needs help. I mean, I mean, they have to make money, right? Now, yeah. people will have varying views on the role of pharma making money, you know, and, and unless you're prepared to nationalize the pharmaceutical industry at that end of the scale, the other end of the scale is ruthless profiteering, and in the middle is probably where we all live. But if you're running a pharmaceutical company, um, I mean, you've got to go where access at least is easy. You don't want to have war, World War Three over a drug before you can get it into the market. Do you think that we lose anything by uh, having nice? Uh, are they? I mean, I don't know what the statistics are, and you would know, but the introduction of new first-in-class drugs, where are we on the, on the international scale of uh, countries that are early adopters? Well, up to, uh, this isn't exactly an answer to the question, but up to the introduction of the Cancer Drugs Fund, we would be supporting um, the use of new cancer treatments at about 65%. So about 65% of the drugs that we looked at in cancer, we would be saying yes to either completely across the full range of variant indications or on some subset, as opposed to uh, if you take, if you took all of the things that we looked at, uh, we were about um, somewhere between 80 and 85%. So clearly there was something about cancer, uh, the nature of that incremental therapeutic benefit and then what the NHS was being asked to pay for that additional benefit that was driving a different decision <coughs> making process. What's going to be very interesting, I think, is to see what happens now that we're through the Cancer Drugs Fund in its original form into a very different world. The Cancer Drugs Fund, as it will be in the future, is a completely different thing for a quite different purpose from the way the old Cancer Drugs Fund was, which is basically, certainly in its early days, pretty much if you got a note from NICE, you could apply to the CDF and somebody started funding you. Um, and everybody recognizes that doesn't make sense. The, the, the industry itself ultimately said, we have to change this, we've got to go back to some system, we have to bring NICE back in line in the evaluative process. And that's where we are now. The question is, will uh, the, the nature of that incremental therapeutic benefits have changed at all in those intervening years? But critically, I think the question is whether or not companies' pricing, approaches to pricing have changed as a result of that experience of being in the CDF, recognizing that's just not a sustainable position for the long term. Mm. Uh, and well, adjusting their ambitions. It's run out price. of money, won't it, eventually, yeah. like all, they, all yeah. these special funds. And I, and I hope that that's, I hope that they will change their attitude to pricing. But I think at the same time, going back to the, where we kind of started with this bit yeah. of the conversation, the <coughs> NHS needs to become a bit more flexible and creative in its approach to adopting new treatments. Yeah. For a long time when NICE was working with its drug evaluation arrangements, we would evaluate a drug and we'd say sort of yes or no. And if it was no, there was nowhere else to go. Uh, we, couldn't, we couldn't say, okay, well, let's all just go into a room and have a chat about this and see if we can work out what the problem is. Can we find a way around it? Is there a different, is there a novel funding mechanism? Can we uh, be flexible about who we're funding and at what price for a period of time? All those sorts of things, which in many respects you think would just make sense because at least um, some patients would get treated mm -hmm. in those circumstances. Um, and that's partly now what the Cancer Drugs Fund is about for new cancer drugs. But I think more generally, we've got to, we've got to have a different paradigm for managing the, what happens after NICE has done the value assessment. So we're very good um, at working out what the additional therapeutic benefits of a new drug is. I don't think there's anybody better in the world than NICE at doing that. We can describe very clearly what you get from this new thing relative to the stuff that we've got at the moment. Um, the question then is, I mean, unless we're in a situation where there's no additional benefits at all, 
which we don't really come across, otherwise the kind of drug probably wouldn't have got a license. But once we know what that additional benefit is, we need to have um, a new approach to working out the deal between the company and the NHS that recognises the NHS's perspective on that additional benefit. Look, we'd love to have it, but have you seen the problems that we've got and the amount of money we haven't got in the system? And the company saying, okay, that's the additional benefit, but have you seen how much money we've spent um, developing this thing? And look at all these other countries around the world that are buying it. We just need to have a, a sort of different forum in which we can work out whether or not there's a solution to that. And sometimes there won't be. The company will just be asking too much for too little. Um, sometimes it'll be dead easy, as it has been in the past. Or the other way around. Between those two things, we need to. I think there are opportunities that we can tease out. Do you, do you really think there's? I mean, I hope you're right because it just seems to me, if I was running a pharmaceutical company, I'd say, look, you know, NHS England is a small market for us, really. Uh, okay, it's important, and everybody loves the NHS, and but you know, it's a small market. They haven't got any money. We're just going to beat our brains out. We'll give it a miss until they get. I mean, we're we're working on well, the same funding as we were in 2000, and now it's 2016. Yeah. Well, they could either say the UK is only three percent of our global global market. It doesn't matter that that much, or they can say, nice guidance, as I have been told by um, company CEOs, influences 35 percent um, of our global market. So, in those circumstances, I think you probably would. Maybe you should charge them. Work with it. <laughs> we are going to charge. Are you? Yeah. How from, much? For what? Well, from April 2017, we're going to charge companies for uh, the tech, the cost of the technology appraisals that we... Really? Have. How interesting. And how much is that going to be? Well, I can't possibly reveal that information because we haven't done the final calculations and we obviously need to... Uh, present that to the companies, and then we need to go through the process of the Department of Health and Treasury to get um, yeah. permission. Have you got a I'm going to say you, you've got to change your enabling legislation to do that. Uh, the, the, we, we need we need a regulation that enables us to raise a charge of that kind. Yeah, yeah. Re it's just a regulation. They do that on a Friday off, wet Friday afternoon in November, and no yeah. one will notice. Yeah. Okay. Well, Hopefully. that's really interesting. Thank you for telling us that. What about the um, the Brexit thing? Let's talk about that for a moment. Um, let's not bother with the politics of it because you know, it's the Barmy army. Um, what uh, what difference is that going to make? Do you think to the pharmaceutical industry? Have you done any modelling or thinking about that? Um, well, it's a big deal, I think, for life sciences because, um, as you know, the UK is part of the um, European wide system for regulating. Uh, the use of life science products. Um, so the MHRA is part of the EMA system, um, and that makes sense in all sorts of ways. And you do have a European business, don't you? We uh, nice. Mm. No, not, no, we don't. I mean, we uh, engage in Europe. Well, that's what I meant. Um, yeah. We're part of all sorts of collaborations yes. um, in Europe, and um, we've had a little bit of money from the European Union to facilitate that. Um, we have some research grants from the European Union, um, which are part of just examining ways to try and make the whole business of licensing and decision making more efficient. Uh, we've learned a lot from um, the experiences of other European countries in the sorts of areas and things that we do. So for us, the relationship with Europe is hugely positive. I mean, I can only hope that um, uh, after we leave the European Union and detach ourselves from the various treaties that connect us, that we'll do the sensible thing and have a medicines treaty that will allow us to link straight back in to the EMA have you, system. Have you making, are you making any... Uh, well, to the extent that if anyone's interested in my view about it, I want to lobby for precisely that. Because otherwise we're going to... Do you have... need legislation or could you not just... Uh... Well, it won't affect NICE because we don't do the licence thing, thing anyway. Mm. Um, I think NICE, uh, I, I mean, obviously, I guess we wouldn't be able to apply for um, European research grants because Europe's not going to give money to us. We're not part of the system. But I don't think it'll stop us collaborating with other European um, entities and organisations where there's a common interest. I can't imagine that post-Brexit uh, the government would say you can't even talk to uh, these other organizations. No, I don't think they do that. It's just the willingness of other countries to talk, isn't it? Well, of course, yeah. Um, I think the kind of the, the the agencies that we deal with 
I'm pretty certain we would want to carry on talking to us because we learn off each other and I see us well thought of <coughs> uh, as an organisation um, and as we develop and do things differently other countries would want to learn from that so just I would be hugely surprised if uh, at a sort of country level or at an institutional level we would have that. The professionals will still want to talk to each other. Yeah. Okay and let's, let's move on. Um, we had a, a great uh, evening here about a fortnight ago with uh, Duncan Selby. He was telling me that. Did he? Yes. What did he say? Oh, he just hugely enjoyed it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. Well, I hope he said that because we enjoyed having him. That was one of them. Yeah, one of them. <laughs> no, he was very good. Um, and um, and uh, it made me actually made me think uh, a bit differently about public health. Uh, but of course, now you're in that space yourself. You're telling us all to use the use the stairs and not let our kids get fat. I mean, what a complete waste of public money that is. Well, I guess it would be um, if um, we were all using the stairs and we didn't have obese children. But <laughs> since we don't, Good we do, um, somebody has to call it. So, Isn't that his job? Well, it's a good question. Now we've got public health, <coughs> we do use obviously it was necessary to sort out the responsibilities that we've got, which we have. Um, NHS England have got a whole series of responsibilities right across the board, including promoting good health. Yeah, so he, he does. We pulled his leg because we said he did port and down and pork sausages <laughs> for the whole lot. <laughs> so, um, so, so we have agreed that um, with our track record and our experience, that we will continue. Uh, to uh, work up and maintain a set of topics where we you know, converted the evidence into a set of recommendations that we'd make sure that we agree those topics with Public Health England, so we're not showing on each other's toes, and that together we, with our particular uh, profile in the system and methods of communication and Public Health England's connections with the system, together promote what it is that we produce. So it's a whole palaver, it'd be easier if one organisation did it all, wouldn't it? Um, well, um, only if you couldn't make that uh, two organisation Well, it just seems to me, I mean, nice is sort of pills, isn't it, really? Uh, and um, Selby is fat kids, you know, I mean, it just seems, it doesn't sit with you. Well, um, we've been good health and pills uh, for 12 years. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Um, so long before Public Health England was a glimmer in Andrew Lansley's eyes. Um, we took responsibility for the Health Development Agency, which had been the Health Education Council of old um, in 2005, uh, and took an organisation that had been um, uh, constrained in terms of what it could do with an evidence base, and brought that expertise in and put a front end on it in a way that NICE did, and made it much more, much clearer to uh, public health professionals. And indeed others inside local government who were and still are a very important uh, audience for NICE. Uh, what it is that they can most usefully do and to apply the same rigour in assessing effectiveness and cost effectiveness as we had been doing in our NHS work. Where, where are you on um, apps and stuff like that? Um, apps and stuff. Um, is um, another name for Workstream 1.2. Right. Sort of Where are you on Workstream 1.2? Uh, Silly old me. <laughs> um, we in Public Health England have been working together to put forward a proposal for uh, actually a really very sensible approach to helping uh, the NHS and the public work out, well, not just the NHS, but the, the sort of health and care system and the public work out which apps are likely to produce the best returns. They're all um, a load of junk, aren't they, really? No. Well, um, they are. I mean, you know, you can download all kinds of crap for your blood pressure and, you know... That's why, that's yeah. why, that's why you need, um, another of the many reasons why you need an organisation. But, but the government, but, but, but we're, so far, we're so far behind, aren't we? I mean, uh, look what's happening in primary care. You can't get, you can't ring up and get an appointment with your GP. You know bring up the golden moments between 8.23 and 8.27 and try and get an appointment in six months' time. We've all done it. So what's happened? Everybody's given up. We've all got Babylon now, which is the app that with the Ali Pass is flogging for £35 a month. Great idea. You can get your GP whenever you want. Uh, and and then and everybody's wearing these Fitbit things. God knows why people wear Fitbit. They're saying, I've done 3,000 steps. You know what? I don't give a shit. You know, what? Are you, you, you going to get to grips with this? And do something before we all 
<laughs> waste our time and fill our iPhones up with crap. Well, what we what we can deliver to the system, if it wants, um, is a system in which there's a kind of hopper mechanism. So um, anybody who's got a health app and thinks it's a really great thing that the NHS or um, the public sector should be promoting uh, can um, do a bit of work to um, assess their products against a framework that we've designed. Um, and Does this include interoperability? Because most of these things don't go anywhere. Increasingly, do as you go through this process, as you sort of trickle down the hopper, as you manage to sort of work your way through because you've got the characteristics that make it look as if this is something that the NHS might either want to buy or recommend, um, yes, interoperability becomes critical until you get to the final stage where actually you get any kind of serious yeah. evaluation yeah. Um, when uh, there's a really rigorous assessment of whether or not what it does, whether it actually works, what it delivers, um, and uh, whether or not um, it connects with the things that it needs to connect if that's part of its functionality. Well, the interoperability, they can't, the but the IT system. people can't work out what interoperability is. I mean, I've been to God knows how many con conferences on interoperability. I mean, how many conferences are they going to have because before they figure out what plugs into what? I sometimes say the same thing, but then I remind myself I have no idea what I'm talking about when it comes to interoperability. And I'm sure you do, Roy. But I suspect that <laughs> well, because I've sat through all these comments, I do actually. There's yeah. a lot more. Uh, yeah. There's a lot more that works and works well in the system than does that doesn't work. And clearly, I mean, we know the NHS is a long way behind other sectors in its use of IT, um, but it's moving rapidly to catch up. Um, and um, I'm genuinely very confident that we, that we will have a system which will provide us with some basic functionality to connect at the admin level. The question is, and, and going back to you know, what are we doing on apps, um, it's, not about that, uh, it's, it's not about that basic transaction stuff, which the NHS needs to get sorted out, yours and my ability to just open up an app and find out the next appointment to our GP and just press the button and that's it which is what we expect now for those sorts of things. But it's those apps particularly where there is um, a claim that's associated with some kind of outcome, particularly a clinical outcome, where I think there's a real risk of stuff being plugged into the system, whether it's for managing diabetes or a mental health condition, uh, where uh, the, clause, the, sim the, 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 the simple, the simplicity of being able to create an app and to put it on the market mm -hmm. Um, uh, when you are effectively um, saying to somebody, if you use this, you can rely on it for some aspect of your health and you can have confidence in what it's saying, what it's telling you, its reassurance or whatever it might be. There's a, there's a real risk there. That's what we have to manage. And that's what I think through this process that we're suggesting we can do for the system. Around things like calibration and stuff like that. It's about calibration, but it's also about the, um, uh, it's about the proposition. Uh, yeah. it's, it's critically about the extent to which we as, in, we as individuals will make decisions to do something or not do something on the basis of what this thing is. Yeah, it's hard to about. see you know, how it all, I, one bit of me wants all this stuff to work because I like all that thing and I think it should work. You know. And another bit of me says, well, you know, what is there that I can measure that anyone's really going to be any interested in? Because if I go to the doctor and say, you know, I, I've got this app and my blood pressure's up, the first thing the doctor's going to do is to take my blood pressure. You know, it's a, I mean, I know you well, could say well, you wouldn't know it was up if you hadn't anything. I mean, I get all the arguments. It just seems to be such a muddle. But it's never going to be the totality of what we need. Um, to manage our He's health. A good old GP. I think there, we've got, I don't them. know. I think we've got five years of all sorts of stuff going on, going wrong, mistakes being made, accidents, all sorts of unfortunate things happening around the use of this technology. And I think then we'll move out into a period in which increasingly we will have things which we will rely on, which will become generalised inside of the system. And from that as a basis in a platform, we'll start to build um, a range of. Um, digital connections um, to our health records, to advice, um, which may be real-time advice, it may be carefully calib calibrated, algorithm-based advice that we can rely on. I think it's just coming. Well, I hope you're right. no well, point well, saying it's, it's always been right coming, isn't it? As long as I can remember, we've been talking about technology and getting over with it. Uh, right, let's do some questions, shall we? What's, um, uh, yes, please, Patrick. 
country cars are coming to serve. A uh, jolly fine company too. Uh, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, obviously a lot of concern in the system about unwarranted variation. Part of which seems to me has been tackled with linking the sustainability and transformation funds to achieving certain metrics and if you don't, you don't get the money. Should adherence and meeting nice guidelines also have those teeth? So you mean penalise organisations for not using guidance? Yeah. <coughs> yeah, well, all, all for incentivising uh, the use of... No, it's all penalising. <laughs> incentivising the use yeah. of uh, <coughs> nice guidance. Um, the, the thing we always have to be careful about is that you know, it's not an instruction to practice in every single case. Um, it is what it says. Uh, it's a very clearly articulated steer, which in the majority of circumstances works for the majority of patients. Uh, so we have to be careful about then how we measure compliance and if we're going to start incentivizing people or in one direction or penalizing them in the other we've got to be very clear that we can be confident that some number either side of the line is the threshold beyond which we're either going we're going to do one or other of those things um, it is quite tri tricky as we've seen using the cloth process uh, we give it up on the to some extent, but people are moving away from that. Look at statins. What an argy bargy there's been over statins. Am I supposed yeah. to be on a statin or not? Can um, anybody tell me? Yes. Yeah. Just by looking at him. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Many. Thank you, doctor. <laughs> Many. No, I don't think so. It's your choice. No, well, it's supposed to be an informed choice, and I've got no well, bloody idea because you can't make your mind up. No, we've, uh, that's <laughs> just not true. You've been reading the wrong newspapers. The Daily Mail. It's, oh, don't, don't I, I write for the Daily Mail occasionally. It's a very fine newspaper. If you read the guidance, we're very clear about the sequence of decision making before you get to the point where you start popping a statin. And it's not. Do you take a statin? No, I don't. I don't. I don't. You look at me. Um, you should. I don't take a statin. Um, but um, I know that if I felt I did, or if I went onto my GP and the GP said, um, uh, you know, you should be considering it. Um, I'd hope that there would be that sequence of decision making, which is about exercise and it's about diet, um, and it's about then, if it looks like the drug is indicated, a conversation about the upsides and the downsides. You know, the upside of it's clearly indicated that you know you've done everything you can with exercise and diet, but if you really want to reduce your uh, risk of a heart attack, then um, this is the next thing that you can do. This is the only other thing you can do. What about an aspirin? But if you take, an aspirin? But if you take this thing, um, you've got these potential downsides. So it's entirely up to you to decide. Oh, you can't it. decide. That's yeah. the trouble. Anybody else got a question? Yeah, oh, we're going, doing well here. Right. Come, yes, ma'am, and then I'll come to you, sir, and then to, to Michael. Yeah, Barbara McLaughlin, Novartis. Um, Novartis. Novartis, indeed. Oh, yes. you sneaked in here, didn't you? Yes. You're my local pharmaceutical company. You're in Frimley, know, aren't you? I know. Jolly nice offices in Frimley. Yeah, not yeah. the best. It was a, a, a very talented chairman of planning that many years ago <laughs> did, did the planning consent on those wonderful offices. Oh, yeah, modesty that. prevents me from. <laughs> It's a very disturbing pattern. Isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> my fingerprints are all over Frimley and Cambly. Yes. Well, I'll tell you a very quick story which has nothing to do with that. Queen Elizabeth uh, Hospital for Children. My mother came here to work in, from Germany to the UK in 1952, and that's where she worked. And she oh, right. Yeah, nice. so, so it's very down, obviously. But um, the question I had was about the Cancer Drugs Fund um, and the conditional approval route that has been introduced. Uh, that requires real-world evidence collection, data collection. How confident are you that the NHS is able to do that data collection? Uh, so we really get results that will then help NICE to take a decision at the end of that year. Well, going into the Cancer Drugs Fund requires additional data to be collected. Um, it doesn't need to be exclusively real-world data. Um, as you know, every patient that receives um, cancer treatment, chemotherapy, of any kind um, has will now have a basic data set recorded which will be available so we will have um, immediately some understanding of the impact of treatment on the patient or the effect of treatment on patients but the idea of the, the new CDF is to make it available for a fixed period of time in you know, a relatively short period of time so we're only talking about a couple of years so we need to be confident that either because a company has already is already running additional clinical studies 
which are likely to report in that time frame. Or we can, in agreement with the company, put in place data collection, uh, a completely new data collection exercise um, that will report in the period of time the drug is in the fund. Um, that if we can't do those two things, then the drug can't go into the CBF. We have to be able to do that. So you can see that already um, the numbers of drugs that are likely to be able to go into the CBF are relatively small. And in addition to the ability to collect rather than traditional data, the drug has already got to be plausibly close to getting approval from NICE. So we're narrowing the field again to a relatively small number of drugs. And when you're in the CDA, um, you're only going to get, in terms of the price, as a starting price in terms of negotiations with NHS England, what you would have got had you put uh, forward a cost-effective price in the first place. And you probably won't get that because NHS England will top slice uh, that figure to make sure that they can operate within the budget. So it's a really challenging place to be. And if I was a company, coming back to our earlier discussion about will companies change their pricing behavior, if I was a company, if I was that close to getting through uh, our first pass nice appraisal, I think I would work very hard to do that. Thank you. Yes, sir. In, uh, you just tell us who you are. Yeah, I'm Tony Bourne. I'm a non-exec director of various healthcare companies, such as Spire, Barchester, various places. Um, in considering charging companies for some of your research costs, are you considering safeguards um, <coughs> to avoid some of the evident conflicts that, for example, got credit rating agencies and such trouble over companies paying yeah. bond ratings? Yeah. And will you also offer <coughs> a sort of quiet service as, as a product is in development, i.e. a silent assessment, not publish, so that the company can go back to the drawing board and refine and perhaps meet some of the improvements that we yeah. make in cost effectiveness. Yeah. Well, taking the second of those first of those two questions first, we already do exactly that. So we provide a fee for service uh, offer to companies, which is very similar to the one that has been provided for a long time by the regulatory bodies, the FDA, the MHRA, and other agencies around the world. Uh, which enables companies to come along and say, look, uh, in the case of a license, this is what we've got, this is the product, this is the mode of action, this is the data set. Have we, have we done the kind of work that would enable you to make a decision? Not, have we done the work to make sure that you're going to say yes, but done enough work so that you don't, when it comes to your advisory committee, say, well, we can't make a decision because you haven't done this study or that study or that area. So we do a very similar thing. Um, and it's, we've been doing it now for about four years and it's really popular uh, with companies. And it's a win-win because we get a better value proposition um, from companies and companies then are in a better position to make sure that they get the best outcome, whatever that turns out to be for them. You're looking for NEDs, aren't you? We're looking for five. Is that advertising for Ned's? Yeah, yeah. I'll be staying behind afterwards to <laughs> take up <laughs> patients from anybody. Well, I'm just thinking story. of applying. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> You'd love that. <laughs> well, I think I should yes. be an interview. <laughs> and, and sorry, on, on the point of conflict. On, on the point of conflict, conflict, sorry, yes. Um, it's a, it's a very good point. It's a very good point. Um, and we started on the basis that um, if the MHRA can charge, as it has done for many years, uh, and create a reputation as one of, if not the best, nationally evaluative agency that's trusted by, I think, pretty much everybody, then we ought to be able to do it too. We've got 17 years worth of demonstrating that we're careful, balanced, independent. Uh, we can take a challenge. We can change when necessary. Um, all sorts of methods and processes that protect the integrity of what we do, that we can raise a charge um, and say that's what happens there, but what happens over here is unaffected by that. Mm. But, you know, um, we're going to have to argue that and demonstrate that, but I hope that we've got enough trust and confidence to have us do that. Michael. Given that to even get a licence, a drug must have had a positive effect on a fairly significant number of people, and given that 
um, we are beginning increasingly to be able to, through biomarkers and genetic testing, predict whether or not a drug is going to work on people. Can you see us getting to a situation where we can say to drug companies, okay, we'll pay you for your drug if it works, but not if it doesn't? This is a very interesting question. I think uh, the more that we are able to be confident about predicting what well, the companies come forward and say, we build a product that providing it's used in patients with these characteristics, it's wor it works, I think there's a much stronger case for that to happen. I mean, that is already happening. Um, when we were talking earlier on about patient access schemes. Um, those sorts of arrangements, those propositions are already being put forward by companies, but they're in a much stronger place to do that, uh, the more confident they are about the ability of their drug to stimulate the response in patients that they say it will. Terry, you got anything on Twitter? Um, no, uh, not, not that I'm going to read out loud. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you you being a nerd or nice is going down extremely well. They're with you on that. One. Yeah, no, they're with you on that. They think that was a very restraint. That you didn't fall off your stool. I've got a lot of support. Yes, ma'am. Far away. Um, a question, just building on your. Tell us who you are. Angela please. McFarland's my last name. Um, just building on your question, your point about in, uh, nice influencing thirty-five percent of the global farm market decisions, which I don't doubt for one moment. You didn't believe that, did you? Um, I bought it. Um, it's Andrew. 17 years of trust is <laughs> balanced. Yeah, I know, I know. Um, but I if I can come back to the new NICE country drug fund and the new arrangements that NICE yeah. has now taken on. So NICE are going to say yes, no, or maybe, free marketing authorization to a drug. Now here's the deal. You're a global pharmaceutical company. To your point uh, earlier on, why on earth are you going to put your drug at risk of getting a nice no free marketing authorization with the knock-on effect that will have around the world? And is it just a very clever way of actually managing access to oncology drugs in an austere environment? Um, well, uh, companies do it. No, I'm talking in the new arrangement. It's in an unknown world that they need to do it. Well, I'm, in a sense, I'm not sure what's changed because um, companies... Free marketing authorization. Free marketing authorization. Yeah, that's oh, sorry. Arrangement. Yeah. Um, well, uh, uh, we'll have to see. I guess is the first cautious response to that. Um, companies are aware that that's the new system that's operating. First thing, the second thing is that the final guidance won't come out until uh, the license has been granted. Um, so, uh, to the extent that it's the final guidance that companies rely on or take any account of in their dialogue with uh, countries and agencies elsewhere in the world, that will be important. Um, I think the, my sense is that the, the UK is still an important place for companies to do business, even though it's a small part of their market, not just because of the effect of NICE guidance, but because of the reputation <coughs> of British medicine and the NHS internationally. Um, I mean, that's not to say that some companies won't look at it and say uh, it's not worth it, it's not worth the risk. But I don't... The uncertainty of Brexit and the EU... Yeah, a combination of those things, yeah. But I genuinely have not heard that said. Um, reg regular conversations with the, both the UK company chief executives and when they visit the UK, the global uh, company chief executive. Um, and I've really not heard, um, since we, <coughs> certainly since we, uh, the proposals for the Cancer Drugs Fund, were launched. Um, company CEOs saying that, and I read them, might say, well, they're not going to tell you, are they? But I just haven't got much impression from them. John? Is NICE fast enough to carry out its assessments, given, particularly on the technology front, the advance of technologies that are developing very rapidly? Um, you know, I'm hearing 48 weeks still for an NTAP assessment, and so it seems like a long period of time for people to have to wait to then get that nod or shake of the head. Mm. Scotland's quicker. Yep, um, it has a shorter process. Um, there's two ways of answering that question. One is that whenever we go out, as we do periodically, to say uh, to all our stakeholders, patient groups, companies, professional groups, everybody else, um, have you got, uh, here's our, here's our here are our methods and processes for doing a technology appraisal. Um, tell us whether or not you think we should change them. 
um, the net effect of all the responses that come back is to make the process even more complicated uh, and longer than it already is because it's high stakes. So everybody always wants more time to engage, more opportunities to engage, and it just adds week, days and weeks to the process. So we are constantly trying to hold the line against that, um, which is, to turn to another way of answering the question, not to say that some fundamental re-engineering of the whole process, which took a completely different view about how much evidence you needed, about how, how careful you need to be in terms of its assessment, about whether or not you need to consult with anybody and for how long, uh, and all those things. We took a completely different approach that you couldn't have a shorter process. Um, and we're not, by any means, I'm not by any means suggesting we are, that we've got uh, the most efficient processes. I'm sure they can always be more efficient. And the conversation that we were just having, the answer to the last question about bringing forward the process so that we started earlier, in the case of, at the moment, just cancer drugs, but it could be extended to other drugs. That was a big argument, wasn't it, years ago, yeah. to speed you up, and you did bring it, you brought in an earlier start. We brought a, we made the process shorter, so it was a long process, it was shorter, we introduced that. The reason that, that uh, I mean, the, the problem was that we were publishing guidance sometimes years after a drug had come to the market. But actually that was not just because we had a long process, it was also because we weren't getting topics referred until long after it had been licensed. Why is Scotland quicker? Is it not as good? Ah, oh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's a, an internationally respected um, drug evaluation system. It's not um, as good as NICE, though, is it? Well, it's done differently, and uh, it's not as good as NICE. It all frequently yeah. comes to the same conclusion. Last question. Oh, we've got two more. Right, be quick because we're up against it. Why do you always ask me questions when we finish? I, I'm prompted by I lose my bonus if I run right over. <laughs> I'm Logan Mayer from Asher. I work for Verbal Lawyers. Um, oh God! Well, you're, not, you're not obliged to say anything unless you wish to do so. Prompted by your Scottish point, because I'm Scottish, but I was interested what you said earlier about pausing effectively the process at the moment in what is the fastest moving R&D sector of all. I remember somebody saying to me 25 years ago that technology has sort of done what it has done. No, I'm not pausing the technology. I'm pausing the uptake. Well, then you're effectively pausing what people put into R&D. Yeah, they can. So we're only three percent of the market. You can certainly. Run. You, you keep yeah. saying that, but it's still a significant part of the market. But to me, when you go into more things, more austere times and reference to other institutions uh, in similar positions to yourselves, what you tend to go is away from a sort of input-based payment, i.e. I've spent a hell of a lot of money, so I need to charge X for it. And you look more at the outputs, and you say, well, if you achieve those outputs, yeah. you actually demonstrate the yeah. savings, then you can charge yeah. more. So, and I think that that's my way, my way of thinking, the way forward is developing those sorts of methodologies. Uh, incentivize, the the incentivize the outcome. Yeah, and, and lots of other parts of It's hard to measure though, isn't it? Do that. I'm going to cut you short if I, I don't think it's that forgive me if I cut you short because I'm mm -hmm. supposed to finish at eight, uh, 7 30, 7 30 now. Uh, but get, the outcome measurement is quite difficult because some of it's quite longitudinal, isn't it? Well, there's the how long does it take for you to be confident about the outcome, and then there's how confident you can be that the thing you're paying for and looking at is exclusively responsible for that outcome as opposed to anything else might have that might be having an effect on the treatment's life generally. So it is a bit tricky, but... Proportionally. Yeah, um, but I think it's definitely worth exploring. I know that some drug companies are very interested in offering an effective service where they say that we'll take this disease stroke problem and we'll manage it for you. But who do you, you know, how do you go about that? You have to tender for that. What if it's just one drug initially? Um, or, you know, how do you do it then? How do you do it at the point at which other drugs come in and start competing? But it's an interesting proposition. So whole disease I, management thing, which, which in the States, is, they kind of part disease management in the States. Yeah, there are, there are, there are ways in that the, there are systems pharmacy benefit companies uh, can take responsibility yeah. for doing it. So well, diabetes is example. an obvious example where, where there's a deal to be done there, but of course there are comorbidities with it, and that, and that starts to make it complicated. I wrote a book on disease management years ago now, and I might have another go at it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, Sam Burridge from CCG in South East London. Oh, uh, really? <laughs> <laughs> quick query if I may. Is that Sam's place? Sam Etherington? No. All right. <laughs> Um, to echo your area and comment around NICE and being formed in a very political environment, how do you feel that NICE has moved in the 17 years through that political environment? And what's the difference to the organisation now from what it was when it was set up? Um, in the context of the 
politics or the political environment. I'm not sure we changed that much. We started off by cutting a deal with the Department of Health, the Secretary of State and the ministers who were then there, that this was only going to work if we could be independent. We have no problem about you deciding that you want us to do these things, but once you've decided that, you have to step back and let us do it. And I have to say that in all the years that we've been going, um, there's never been uh, a case in which we quietly behind the scenes have been instructed to do anything. I mean, in some circumstances where we've had some pretty robust conversations, uh, but we have never produced a piece of guidance which isn't the guidance that we as an organisation think it's appropriate to put out. And I think the longer you do that, it just becomes part of how of the organisation you are and the nature of that relationship gets inherited by successive groups of ministers. Um, so I think it's kind of, it's, it's okay. I don't, I don't feel anxious every time we get a new Secretary of State or a new minister, as indeed we're about to do, since George Freeman has now left the government and moved on to do something mm -hmm. else. So someone else has come in, and I feel confident that there's something uh, in the inherited, uh, the, you know, the collective memory inside the Department of Health that will, will keep us um, okay. But we, you have to be continually vigilant. And more than anything else, I think you have to demonstrate competence. If you, if you demonstrate competence, if, you can, if you're an incoming minister and the briefing you get from the civil servants is that this is an organisation uh, that will create problems from time to time, it's in the nature of what they do, uh, but functions well, understands the nature of its brief, is careful, gives us a heads up when we need to have a, head, have a heads up, um, and is confident in the way it goes about things. Um, I think you're okay. If you get the briefing is, you know, this is an organisation that's just a mess, then you can expect much more in the way of interference from... Um, Interesting. Uh, I'm sorry that George Freeman has gone, actually. Yeah. I thought he was a good bloke. Yeah. Yes, yeah. And he had a life before he came into Parliament as well. Yeah. He had a proper job before he became an MP, which yeah. I think is always a good thing. Uh, final question, Manchester United uh, this year. What are your prospects? Things can only get better. <laughs> <laughs> what a great note to end on. Uh, Andrew, you've been a, a really engaging, entertaining and very uh, uh, a transparent and open guest and, and one of the best and I'm really grateful to you for your time uh, before we always like to say thank you with a little gift John's got it here it's a bottle of um, the world's finest whiskey uh, it's Pendering it's made in Wales it's Welsh whiskey and right. um, I can tell you that I have done the appraisal, uh, <laughs> and, and it works. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Andrew Dillon, thank you very much. <laughs>